after all the presentations we've heard today, I feel like I can just go home now. Uh, because if we've heard anything uh, today, we've heard a lot about the patient education and safety um, principles at hand. By the end of this presentation, I hope we can identify a couple strategies or a couple issues related to patient safety and education and as well um, the safety of uh, folks during in the education during uh, Medicaid-assisted treatment related to benzodiazepine use. This is generally how I feel whenever uh, someone asked me to talk about benzos and medication-assisted therapy, um, having worked with kids over the years. Um, you know, it's one of those things that you just go, okay, what part do I need to talk about? Um, addiction and, and medication-assisted therapy um, treatment require, if we're going to do that, a box of tools. We, there's not one set of tools that is going to be um, absolutely the best scenario for every individual. Each person we've heard has to be individualized in terms of treatment, but we have to open up that box and we have to look at a set of tools, um, multiple sets of tools, what works, what does not work. We have evidence-based practices for recovery. We have evidence-based practices for psychiatry. We have evidence based practices for medical treatment, but I'm glad to see that the, you know, gap between those have been brought together and that we're working on guidelines to make that for what happens whenever we're treating all of these things together. So I'm sure you share in my feelings um, about, like, what are we going to do now? What do we talk about? We have so many challenges. Um, presenting to us, and some of those we've already talked about today. How do we know if a person is on benzodiazepines? How do we know if a person's in medication-assisted therapy? What do we know about the effects of benzodiazepines while they're on methadone or buprenorphine? What do we tell that person about benzodiazepine use during a medication-assisted therapy experience? How do we present that to them? What's our role in coordinating the care plan for a person on benzodiazepines during medication-assisted therapy? What do we know will promote the safety and maximum optical outcomes for the person on benzos that are in medication-assisted therapy? And overall, what is our treatment plan to promote the best treatment outcomes for persons on benzos? Despite the well-researched and documented studies making recommendations for the care of persons in medication-assisted therapy, there's still a lot of ambivalence about treatment planning towards recovery. Yeah. <laughs> huh? The goal of medication-assisted therapy. What are the goals? This is a time after lunch, guys. I'm not going to do all the work up here. What's the goal? Recovery. Safety. Safe recovery. Okay. All right. We're not too far there. Okay. Just wanted to get you started a little bit. Y'all are like, talk about deer in the headlights out here. What does that look like in medication-assisted therapy? It's the primary tenet, no matter what discipline we're in, whether we're physicians, we're nurses, we're social workers, we're addictions professionals, um, and some may say um, just a moral obligation of individual to individual, the primary tenet in the foundation of the care plan for the member and intervention is patient safety. That's first and foremost. If we don't do anything else, that's one thing that we need to do. And so that means reasonable judgment. You know, we just heard Dr. Thomas talk about those things. And I think that makes common sense. So it's not rocket science here. Safety is utmost of important. And if we don't know anything else, the use of benzodiazepines while in methadone-assisted therapy can be dangerous. That doesn't mean that it's not dealt with. It doesn't mean that it's not managed. It doesn't mean that benzos are never prescribed to anyone in programs. 
or on buprenorphine. But what it means is that we need to understand the risks, we need to understand the dangers, and we need to be appropriately equipped to handle those. Thorough assessments must be completed by in any setting that that person touches. And I'm going to be talking a lot about the person because the person that's presenting to us is the key factor wherever they go. And the outcome is going to be up to them, ultimately. But we have an obligation to be part of that when they're coming to us. So whatever setting we're in, we can't say, oh, I didn't know that that was happening, or I didn't realize the consequences of that, or I wasn't aware. We have to make ourselves aware. So that means changing our practices to be very collegial and collaborative and working within those confidentiality guidelines, but figuring out what we need to know and making sure what's told is told. And it, it, it is just to establish a fundamental information prior to implementing interventions. So many times I've had people sign on the dotted line and then a year into treatment go, I didn't know that, I was never told that, or I didn't understand that. Well, we have to make sure that people do understand that. And we have to make sure as treating physicians that we understand that. When I worked with pregnant women, one of the biggest things that folks would come across is people never told the women accurately about what methadone at that point was what we were prescribing would do to the fetus. And it wasn't done in detail. It wasn't done accurately. And so it's really important that people understand that, that we have an obligation to understand that as the clinicians. We have to consider the amnesic effects and the potentiating effects of benzodiazepine use during medication-assisted therapy. As Dr. Dway, he talked about the cognitive deficits that occur. The amnesic effect, oftentimes, folks don't realize that what they're doing. So sitting there and telling them something, they have no idea what is going on with that. And they have trouble processing that sometimes whenever the medications are actively working within them. So we have to work with them to describe that. And that's where bringing in family members, bringing in other, other folks that are in their lives. Having clinical interventions may be helpful. Guidelines for addressing licit and illicit benzodiazepine use during medication-assisted therapy must be established. You know, for someone who has tried a multitude of strategies to quell anxiety, um, and has been deemed that the most appropriate effect is benzodiazepine, their guidelines for continuing that benzodiazepine has to be different than someone who is uh, procuring this illicitly, someone that has not prescribed it, and someone who has those impairments that we see during group or at the dosing window or driving their cars with their children in it outside the program. We have obligations to treat those things differently, and we need to establish those guidelines. The effects of benzodiazepine dependence must be considered when implementing a comprehensive treatment plan. We cannot expect a person to just get off those drugs and just, okay, you're going to get off and we'll give you so many days to do that. And it has to be like, what are all these things that they're going to be dealing with? What are all the, what are all the consequences? Is it just physical? Is it emotional? Um, how's this going to impact their lives? How is this going to affect their children? we have to consider how this dependence, and the, particularly the dependence aspect in regards to what does that withdrawal mean? I've had some very well-intentioned physicians say, well, you know, you gotta get off those benzos, those aren't good, you know, that withdrawal's gonna be real hard on that baby, but at the same time not telling the woman how to get off and her going into seizures, causing fetal loss. And yet at the same time, we have to understand what level of use they're at. Are they at a, a use level, which is prescribed and they're within the confines of that? Are they at a misuse level? Are they at an abuse level? Or are they at a dependent level? Just like we would with every other type of drug. Alternative treatment options offered must be effectively addressed the effects on recovery and co-occurring disorders. Replacing one drug for another drug that is equally as dangerous is not going to be the answer. But treatment, often, treatment options um, that do support the recovery is so important. We do have to assess for the co-occurring disorders. 
and self-medication and concurrent prescription writing practices must be addressed by the MATP site as well as other providers of care for that person. So collaboration is just essential and we have heard that so often. We know that there's a lot of different people um, prescribing at this point and so there has to be an open communication and yet very often we on our side might head into um, the um, confidentiality guidelines, or we just might not even try to do that, and I've had that happen, that we never even tried to collaborate, and we really do need to do that at this point. Recovery is the goal for medication-assisted therapy, so you guys get the, the, the star for the, uh, the afternoon. So consideration of how the benzodiazepines affect this is essential. The person on benzodiazepines must be educated about the indications for benzodiazepine use, their effects, their side effects, drug interactions, their risk benefits, and possible alternative therapies. We talked about a lot of those today, so I won't spend time, but one of the important things is folks aren't educated about this that are taking them. They don't always understand that there's other things that they could take, that it was meant to be a short-term therapy. They don't understand about the effects of the drugs. Medication-assisted treatment must address this and have safe and effective resources available to manage persons taking benzodiazepines. We have to have that toolbox, and we have to have it wide open sometimes because, you know, if you have a person that's in, in medication-assisted therapy and if they need to go to inpatient, being able to find an inpatient uh, facility available so that they can be on methadone but still decrease their dose or to get some other kind of treatment is oftentimes a challenge you know, and we need to be able to better address this. Clinicians must be well informed and consider the goals of the person in treatment setting where the education is delivered. We need to bump up our skill set. You know, lots of times as, you know, counselors, we get in a certain skill set and there's certain things that we do, and as doctors, there's certain things we do, and as nurses, we need to be cross-trained and we need to bump up that skill set. We need to improve that, that toolbox that we have and we need to add things into that. The education needs to be multimodal. It can be reading, it can be videoed, it can be um, individual, it can be group, and it has to be throughout care. And we need to work at curriculum development. There was one study that I did find related to educational programs and the use of benzodiazepines, and it was a study from Europe, and it was quite old, but even three educational sessions drastically reduced the amount of benzodiazepine use in that population. So think of what we can do if we targeted that into um, a targeted kind of intervention for persons. It might have a greater outcome. And we must consider the goals of the person, you know, and what their, what their goals are about that. Is it elimination of the use or is it their life manageability and recovery? And if it is, how does that fit into this whole picture? It must be factual and, you know, I don't need to tell you about all the horror stories that are out there and all the misconceptions that are out there. It needs to be ongoing, repetitive, and provided by all members of the treatment team, not, well, I know the doctor wanted you to do that, but I heard of this over here. And No, no, no. It has to be supported, and it has to be encouraged, and it has to be, we have to support each other in targeting this goal. And it also involves the person that's using the benzodiazepines, as well as significant support persons. We've talked about family. We sometimes will other talk about other significant people in their lives so that their support system is big. And sometimes that's employers, sometimes that's, you know, community people, sometimes it's just their sponsors, sometimes it's people that they just love and love them. And so we have to bring them into treatment as well. Um, it should in, um, reflect the person's treatment goals, learning style, and different people learn differently, you know, in terms of uh, information, and we need to make sure we bring it to them in a format so that they can understand that. The learning style of the person must be identified so that we can modify that presentation to them so that they can get the information. The skills of the clinician, as we talked about, are essential. And the acceptance of a person to address the use of benzodiazepines includes the self-responsibility. It's their treatment and their recovery, and it's essential if this is going to work during the um, treatment episode. 
and I'd like to leave some time, not for me to ask questions, but to ask you two questions. What are the two issues related to the education and safety of persons in methadone treatment uh, regarding benzodiazepine use? What are two things you heard today? Pardon me? Individualized treatment. Very good. Something else we heard? Safety. Documentation, documentation, documentation. Education. And what are some of our strategies that we can use? I'm sorry. Non-pharmacological treatments, very good. Something else? Coordinated care. Coordinated care, bingo, you got it. Thank you so much. And our final uh, presenter before we move to